I think there are three river knees in Ireland. The flurry is the glass gottling. Um, and again, we come back to this in terms of its identification. The big river is the Cron, and the third of the Cooley rivers is the Ryland, which is the Culpa. Uh, it's interesting that the Ryland uh, itself has, has posed some difficulties in, in terms of identification. It seems to be a very recent name. There is a family name called Ryland, which is present in Newry uh, in the early 19th century, but uh, a number of people have pointed out to me uh, that the word Ryland could come from the Irish word Rithlin, meaning uh, whirl or torrent, uh, which would be very characteristic of the um, um, floods and spates that affect uh, not only the Ryland River, but also the Big River and uh, occasionally the Flurry as well. So in, in a mountainous region like Cooley um, will, of course, uh, attract uh, precipitation. And in very bad weather, these rivers can rise and turn into uh, torrents while at most uh, quarters of the year they're fairly benign streams. Now, it all seems straightforward, but um, back in the 19th century, none of this was known. There were problems, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, there were excuses why it was not known. Firstly, the texts of the time as they survive in the Book of Leinster and in La Rohira, the Book of the Dun Cow, weren't available in good translations. So in the 1850s, uh, when John O'Donovan was producing his masterful um, translation of the uh, Four Masters, uh, the, uh, uh, the Annals of the Kingdom of Ireland, you can see the spine of it there on the left, um, he was uh, effectively floundering in the dark, uh, trying to work out what old names mentioned in the Annals um, what were their equivalent modern names? So one of the decisions he took uh, in editing the Four Masters was to uh, create a series, a myriad series of footnotes, uh, one of which is given here, and which is the footnote for Ma Morhevna, the Plain of Morhevna, a name that we're all familiar with. And he describes it as a level country in the present county of Loud, extending from the River Boyne to the mountains of Coolinia or Carlingford. Dundalk, Louth, Dromiskin, Fahart, and Monster Boys are mentioned as in this plain. See the Annals of Tiernock for AD 2002. See Usher's Primordia at various pages. The territory was otherwise called Makura Arila and Kunla Merhevna. Now, therein lies a problem. Um, O'Donovan was the premier toponymist of his age, a uh, toponymist being a person who identifies and studies place names. He was also uh, a major um, historian of his age. He was also a major linguist of his age. Um, so he was a multi-talented chap, but he was very busy. And he made these identifications um, in the course of a very busy career. And in many occasions, he got them right. But on other occasions, he didn't. The problem with O'Donovan's identifications is that whatever he said was uh, the location of a place became almost biblical in terms of its prestige. And close on five generations of scholars um, have, in a sense, worshipped at O'Donovan's door. They've opened the pages of the great seven volume or six volume four masters. They've looked at the footnotes. And if O'Donovan says that Marmar Hevna extends from the mountains of Cooley down to the River Boyne, then it does. So it's important to note that his definition of Marmarhevna is that it starts at Cooley and it goes down to Carlingford, or down to uh, the River Boyne. The second thing he does there is that he puts in two other place names, Makara Orila and Cunla Marhevna. Now, Orila uh, is preserved in the name Oriel, and it was part of a medieval kingdom that extended into Tyrone, uh, but also stretched right down into East Monaghan and Louth. It was a 11th, um, 9th to 12th century kingdom. Um, it was a loose amalgamation of tribal groups um, and therefore to equate it without uh, any caveats with Marmar Hevna is in a sense muddying the waters. But then it gets even more um, murky because he says that Connellan Marhevna, meaning the Marhevna of the Connellys, is also the same as Marmar Hevna. Now, any of you who know your North Louth history, particularly your pre-Norman North history, will know that Conlamar Hevna was a kingdom 
which was probably eclipsed by the rise of Aurelia, um, probably eclipsed as an independent entity by certainly by the ninth century. And um, Cunliam Mahavni was restricted to the area stretching from perhaps Mike in South Armagh down to um, the Glyde River. Um, so maybe Stabana, uh, and then stretching slightly into Iman and into Inishkeen. But it was a North Loud territory. It was, did not extend to the River Boyne. But this footnote gives one the impression that all three entities, Marmarhevna, Makarorila, and Cunlamarhevna, are all the same. That's the first thing we need to note. The second thing is another footnote put in by O'Donovan. Um, these footnotes, by the way, are, are, are appended on to entries in the um, annual uh, chronicle, which is the Annals of the Four Masters. And in this particular one, you can see the three rivers are being explained um, because in this particular entry, um, the, uh, he is documenting not, um, not the ages of Christ, i.e. AD 500 or AD 1500, he's documenting the Anno Mundi, the earliest entries in the annals, which are tracing and linking the Irish national narrative back to biblical sources. So um, these are footnotes to the emergence of rivers. In other words, rivers are exploding onto the landscape. Forests are being created. Forts are being built, all by mythological agency. And he's explaining where these, um, uh, where these rivers are today. And he tells us that the River Nee was the ancient name of the River of Ardee flowing to the pain of Conlam or Hevda in the County Louth. Now that identification flows from the previous statement, having worked out that Conlam or Hevna or Mom or Hevna extends from Cooley to the River Boyne, it therefore uh, follows logically that uh, the placement of the River Nee on the River Dee is logical because according to Donovan's view of it, um, the RD was in Conal Merhevna. But anybody who now knows Allah history will know that RD was not in Conal Merhevna. It was in uh, the territory of Farard, possibly Farroche, um, two separate entities uh, and therefore different. Now, that's a little bit nitpicking, as it were, but it's important for understanding what happens. When we get the first uh, map of the route of the time uh, ever published, uh, we begin to see some of the consequences of O'Donovan's identification. This um, is a map published uh, in Eleanor Hull's fantastic book, The Cuchulain Saga, 1898. It's a summation of um, not only the toyn, but of many of the Ulster cycle stories about the conception of Cuchulain, about the death of Cuchulain, both of which events, of course, precede and post-date the toyn itself. And um, in order to flesh out the book, she commissioned uh, Standish O'Grady, uh, one of the great scholars of um, the earliest scholars uh, of um, the um, epic literature of medieval Ireland, to create a map. It was the first time anybody had attempted this, and it was published um, as the preface to the book in 1898. And we take that map when we explode it, uh, and if I can get my highlighters to work. Um, and get some red, um, and I need something better than that. Uh, I need a highlighter, yeah. We can see that the toyn starts, sorry, I got the wrong color here. The toyn starts at Rathcrohan in Connacht. The arrows indicate the direction of the movement of the army. There's an arrow. Uh, and you can see here that the army take off from Rathcrohan and they go in a loop before they cross the Shannon. That is picking up the tradition, which is mentioned in the time that um, uh, Fergus MacGroth, who is of course the exiled King of Ulster, who's the lover of Queen Maeve and is part of her arm, army. Um, he's a traitor to his own people, as it were. He's having scruples um, as the army sets out and he leads them astray. So O'Grady is picking up that and mapping it and hence that loop feature. He then has the army uh, progress its way, um, not through Louds as so very much as going up through Inishkeen, as we shall see in the next highlight, 
Um, and unfortunately, my highlight stay with us. So excuse that. So this is the line of the army going up and bypassing uh, Cooley altogether. And it's only on the return route from John Severick, uh, which is mentioned in the time, that they cross at what appears to be narrow water, come through Cooley, and then proceed down to RD. So Cooley is hardly mentioned at all in this particular map reconstruction, the earliest map reconstruction of the time. RD is mentioned because it's a known place and because it's where Fergus and Cuchulain have their fatal combat. And um, there's no doubt that the placement uh, of the River Knee on the River Dee, and you can see the River Dee being represented there, um, by O'Donovan is influencing um, O'Grady as he's drawing the map. Now, let's see the consequences of this. In the first 20 years of the 20th century, a series of translations, accurate translations and transcriptions of the time appear. The first of them is by Mary Hutton, who we mentioned uh, earlier. Her uh, translation is an English verse translation uh, published in 1907. It's followed, uh, preceded by, in 1904, by um, a, a very academic translation uh, by uh, Winifred Faraday, and then is followed uh, in 1914 by Joseph Dunn's translation, which we're going to quote from here. Uh, and this is, has a wonderful title, The Ancient Irish Epic Toyn Bo a very fine cover, if you ever get a copy of the original. That is the spine of the copy that I got, but, um, um, I might have got a bargain, but at the same time, the bargain was fairly shook when I got it. It's described euphemistically in the seller's catalogue as a reader's copy, meaning the cover was falling off, um, and that's what the cover looks like. Now, interesting thing about um, um, these translations is that Dunn um, and one of the others have indexes for the first time. We not only get translations of the time, but we get an index. And that's the title page of the index. And when we go to the River Nee, we see it says the River Dee, which flows by RD in the county of Louth. He's picking up uh, where O'Donovan left off. He's well over 50 years after O'Donovan, but nobody has contradicted O'Donovan. So Joseph Dunn, who's an American-based academic, um, he's a book, bookish chap, he may have visited Ireland for all I know, but it's very, very uh, unlikely that he ever, vis uh, ever visited or did any serious field work in Laos uh, or in Cooley. Um, so he follows um, the great 19th century scholar and we still have the River Nee at the RD. A third example uh, of this um, is um, Father Thomas Gogarty, one of the great priest scholars of the early 20th century. Uh, priest scholars have disappeared from the map uh, effectively. But when you consider that um, um, people like Paul, Father Paul Walsh um, and uh, a, more locally Father German MacIver, who was the um, president and secretary of the Louth Archaeological Society many years, were fantastic scholars in their own right, as well as fulfilling their pastoral uh, duties. Um, and Gogarty is um, remembered today because he produced um, a, a translation or an edited edition of the Corporation of Drawda Records, um, which is um, a very, very important um, a publication for the history of Drawda. Um, as he, it states there in that brief bi biographical note, he was very active in the Archaeological Society um, for uh, over a decade. And um, in the archives of the Society, there is this uh, unpublished paper by Gogarty called Thorn Bo Coolinia, as it states there. Uh, this is a photocopy of the galleys. Nobody does galleys anymore, but the printers amongst you will be familiar with them. Long strips of paper um, stretching um, the height of a man or a woman uh, on which your text was printed but not divided into pages yet. And these galleys survive of a very, very confusing article uh, about the time, particularly in County Louth. Now, one of the reasons it's confusing is because Gogarty himself was probably not as topographically aware as he might have been. But the other reason was he was following O'Donovan. And if O'Donovan said the River Nee, which we know to be the castle town, was in RD, all the other place names that flow from it and around it in the story have to be somewhere near RD. So Father Gogarty was looking for, ah, 
Pen, which we would call Dundalk Bay, he was looking for it somewhere off the coast of Anagassan. Um, and this is the problem that all the scholars faced in the early 19th century. Because of the misplacement of the River Nee on the Arty River, everything around it in the narrative is uh, proving very difficult to locate because they're looking in the wrong place. This persistence of the legacy of O'Donovan comes right up to the present day. There's um, a one to 50,000 scale, what's called Discovery Series map of RD. This is a 1997 edition, but it has not changed to the present day. I did a screen grab of this uh, this afternoon from the Heritage Maps. You see the Heritage Maps logo. Um, they're produced uh, online by the Heritage Council. Fantastic set of maps if you haven't ever consulted them. And uh, here you got RD, and right beside it, the River D is on me. Right to this day, this equation of what we know to be the Castletown River um, is in fact equated with the River D. Now that's, you know, that's on a map, but one of the things that um, irritates me every time I drive the M1 motorway and when I cross the River Dee, I see this sign and it says, On Knee River Dee. Now, if my father-in-law, Pat Byrne, was alive, he'd be talking about boot polish and angle grinders and moonless nights. <laughs> uh, Paul, we need to write this wrong. But of course, um, this is not, need not concern good Cooley folk. Um, this is another battle, as it were, but it is important for understanding the coin in Cooley. Um, Let's look at the actual statement that was misread by O'Donovan. Lehen stood at the ford on the River Knee in Connella in a rage at what Cucullan had done and waited for him, but Cucullan cut off his head and left it with the body. The ford on the knee is named Ah Lehen from this. Now, this is the map produced by Kinsler and Haley, and this is the genius of what they did. They identified for the first time that the castle town was on the River Knee. You probably have difficulty seeing that, but it's clear. Uh, uh, the River Knee is written below Castletown River. They're clear that this is in a place called Connella, and they know in 1960s that Connella Morhevna is only, it's a territory restricted to North Louth, parts of South Armagh, parts of East Monaghan, but does not include Coolinia. And of course, we have Coolinia clearly marked. Thirdly, quite clearly, the ford on the knee is named Ah Lehen for this. So the actual scene of the decapitation of Lehen by uh, Cú happens somewhere out in what we would call Dundalk Bay today. So this is particularly important because once they made that shift in the 60s and replay, and this was the work of Jean Haley, this is an American scholar, not an Irish person who does it, um, once that happens, Kinsella picks it up, Kinsella publishes it with his map. Unfortunately, the two men never get to publish their book and we're left with the map. Uh, and due, as, as a sense, due credit has never been given to, particularly to Haley, um, and less so to Kinsella, for this huge shift uh, in the geography of the time. One of the funny things about Kinsella's translation is that I get the impression that it's never been fully accepted by the academy, as it were, of philologists and medieval historians who have studied the time. Um, because the, the research behind these maps was never published, it was never accepted um, with perhaps in the enthusiasm that it should have been, because it was a major breakthrough, as we shall see. Oh, the River Nee is the Castletown River. Now, I picked up on this um, in about 2011. Um, I am a native of Dundalk, um, a frequent visitor to Louth. Um, I could see Louth. I could see the Cooley Mountains out my bedroom window every evening, um, living in Hill Street, Dublin Road. And... Um, Never really had that much interest in it until I became, um, I suppose, my late teens, early 20s. And I don't know where I picked it up, but it just entered into my system, as it were. So around about 
uh, it festered there for quite a while. And though I did many uh, a guided tour of Carlingford and the Cooley Peninsula, it wasn't until 2011 I decided I'd have to start writing something in this. So I wrote this paper in 2014 with the encouragement of Jim Mallory uh, of Queen's University and published it in the Navin Research Group. The Navin Research Group refers to Navin Fort in County Armagh, not Navin in Meath. And uh, what I did was I tried to underpin the maps, the research that had never been published by Haley and Kinsler. I sought to explore the reasoning behind the placement of each name that they had and their reconstruction of the route. Since then, I've published three um, heritage guides through the um, uh, grants from the Heritage Council and the mechanism known as the Heritage Guide published by Archaeology Ireland. And I'm hoping that I will be able to produce a fourth uh, on uh, the town in County Armagh and County Down. Um, but that is, uh, that's for the future. And in these, I have taken the information that Kinsella and Haley developed, uh, having, it, having examined it uh, with some rigor, as it were, in the Emania Journal, then have taken it and plotted it onto one inch maps um, to make it accessible um, to community groups uh, for on the full route of the town, including the journey back to Cooley, back to Crookan, back to Rathcrohan, uh, which is what's covered by the um, third guide uh, that for counties Meath and West Meath. In the meantime, I was also uh, uh, got involved in uh, a walking festival uh, known to most of you as the Thine March, a community walking festival. This particular shot, I can't remember who took it. It's in Francis Street in Dundalk. Uh, and it's probably apt that it's been led by the then tourism officer for Cooley, Francis Taylor. May Fain, or yours truly, is there behind him uh, um, going through some kind of a midlife crisis um, and cross-dressing, but I'm not alone because uh, there are two b, &B providers uh, in the background also suffering from the same affliction, um, um, Kevin Woods and um, Tim Mullins, um, to name two. Uh, these men, in fact, were the people who set up the uh, very imaginative uh, initiative um, called the Town March. I remember when I saw it first thinking, this is bad, they're praising Queen Maeve and she's the enemy. Uh, but in fact, um, the develop whole concept of it developed by Kevin and, and Tim is a very, very imaginative concept. Uh, the idea of a moving festival uh, covering over 250 kilometers uh, run annually, but of course suspended this uh, past 12 months. But this uh, walking festival offered me the opportunity to talk to people as we uh, traversed the byroads from Roscommon to Cooley over a period of nine years um, between 2012 and 2020. So, as a result of that, I've been able to make revisions to the mapping of Cooley. The breakthrough that was made by Kinsley and Haley needs to be celebrated. It has not been properly celebrated in populist or tourism literature. Uh, Kinsley is still alive. Uh, there's a set of essays being produced for him um, in, this, in the next 12 months, um, being edited no less by a Dundalk woman, uh, Adrienne Levy, who's based in Phoenix. And she has put together um, a very uh, fine set of essays. And that will be launched hopefully in, in 2022 um, and presented um, to the poet, as it were. Um, this um, uh, initiative will, 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 will again bring uh, Kinsler's contributions, uh, and particularly in terms of the Town and Cooley, into focus. But what I've done um, with Haley and Kinsler's route, here, here a very classically recorded um, in red on the, it's a, it's a two color print. Uh, red and black in their map, uh, one of the maps in the 1970 edition, is that I've revised it. And what I'm going to do now is show you some of the revisions I've been able to make this on the basis of looking at the literature, remembering that Jean Haley was based in Harvard, Kinsler was based in Dublin in 1969-70, but in fact was based in America most of the time. And while these men did make regular visits to Cooley in that period, and while they did make very great inroads into identifying the time, the work, in a sense, is unfinished. And of course, the work on the town place names and the work on the town will be unfinished forever. Each generation brings its own reading to it. And what I'm doing is bringing my reading 
uh, to bear on it. The first thing that I've been able to do is to add folklore to the manuscript identifications. So recensions one to three here represent place names identified from the manuscript versions of the time plotted onto the maps. The root in black is the root identified by Hinsley and Cayley, uh, Haley and Kinsler, and the red dots represent some of the places they identified. What I've done is I've been able to add folkloric identifications to this. The first of these relates to a place called Boham Whale. It's a cul-de-sac on the road from the dock to Black Rock. Um, in the 1970s, it was the subject of a most interesting high court case over a right of way. The case hinged on the fact as to whether Boreham Whale was a through route from the Dublin Road to the Black Rock Road or whether it was, uh, whether that through route had, uh, had been extinguished by lack of use. And um, no less a, um, a person than Noel Ross, um, editor of the Louth Archaeological Journal, was summoned to the High Court with others to testify that Queen Maeve had travelled down this road according to the Sheridan family who still lived there. And not only was she travelling down the road, she was heading towards the coast. And the Sheridan still have this story. And that was recorded, it's enshrined in the um, law reports for 1973. Um, so you can't get um, much better than that in terms of um, sworn testimony. And that um, is interesting because Moreham Whale brings you onto the coast just at the south end of the Lokers, just where you hit the craggy foreshore of Black Rock. And it's matched by a story which was recorded by Redmond McGrath, uh, who used to have a shop, I think, in Church Street in Dundalk, a founder member of the Louth Archaeological Society, who tells, uh, and this was recorded by Paddy Power, uh, never published, but it's a transcript in the Louth Society archives, who um, interviewed and then transcribed a testimony of Redmond McGrath, I'm not sure when, probably in the 50s or 40s, um, actually probably earlier than that, um, it could be in the, the late 30s, early 40s. But Redmond McGraw recounted that he was sent out to Rampark uh, in Cooley as a child. And he used to sit with the fishermen who were repairing their nets. And he asked one day, what were the line of stones stretching out into the sea at Rampark? And he was told that this was Tlohan Meve, Maeve stepping stones. And the old fisherman told Redmond McGraw that at certain times of the year, in certain conditions, you could hear a clash of metal out in Dundalk Bay, which represented the ghost of a huge army engaged in combat. Um, so this, uh, these two places uh, are fascinating because while they're seven kilometers apart, they do represent a tradition which was current until very recently where people could walk across Dundalk Bay. Now, doing that would be treacherous today because of the ship channel. Uh, but before the ship channel was cut in the 19th century, it was quite possible to walk across the bay, provided you knew the run of the tides. And it's still possible to do that if you are particularly skillful uh, and know your tides um, and pick the right um, moon, as it were, but not for the faint-hearted. And certainly you'd need a guide to do it today. But this idea of crossing the bay as a shortcut um, would mean that anybody coming to North Louth, such as Queen Maeve, uh, would recognise that it would be much easier to make this transect of the bay, uh, led by a local guide, um, rather than to, to try to negotiate um, the Castletown River, the River Nee, commanded by Delga, which is the home place of Cook Cullen, and he was defending, of course, his home place of Coolinia and Ulster from this marauding queen. So in terms of the, uh, the story itself, it may be fictional, but the setting, the geographic setting of the time is quite remarkable. I, I often think it's comparable to uh, Joyce's uh, reimagining of Dublin, while the story of Ulysses is, is, a, is fiction, the setting is topographically uh, precise. And I think the time um, approaches that. Now, once we get to Cooley, uh, we find that Kinsella and Haley state that Queen may have camped at a fort called Taprath near the bush. Now that fort we'll come to in more detail in a few moments, but what I've done is I've taken that off the map and I've identified where that site was. That site was not at the bush, it was at um, what is miscalled 
they are Balagan Point, in fact, Cooley Point, near Templeton Beach. And we come back to this and explain uh, the reasoning behind this. Uh, remembering uh, that the name of this encampment um, in the Toyn is Finnevar Coolinia. And remember what Finnevar means? White water of Cooley. So I'm contending that the actual place where Queen Maeve camped was at uh, Cooley Point. The second name that you, we shall um, change is the Windy Gap. The Windy Gap at the top of Glenmore is equated by Kinsella and by Haley and many others as Barnes Bocoolinia. And we'll come and look at this in detail in a moment. The actual Barnes Bocoolinia is on Barnavave Mountain, as anybody, particularly the hill workers, the children and the farmers of Cooley all know this from time immemorial, but unfortunately the academics don't or didn't until recently. The third one that we should change in terms of their identification is this uh, site dot here at Taylor's Bridge on Rayton Ravensdale, which is marked Bellat Alone. And Bellat Alone is actually, sorry, no, the, the dot that I'm going to change is the Ballymacallet stream. The Ballymacallet stream is equated by Haley and Kinsella with the Gatlick, River Gatlick, the Glass, Glass Gatlick. But the Glass Gatlick has been identified by Nulligan Marila and others in the Place Names Commission of the Irish Government as the actual River Flurry itself. So we're changing that name um, as well. The third one is this name here, Bellet Alone. Bellet means a, a pass, a, 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 a narrow way between two territories is the definition of it in the um, Dictionary of the Irish Language. So the placing of it at Taylor's Bridge by Haley and Kinsley is inaccurate. And it's much more likely to have been um, up on the mountain of Cooley itself, quite close to uh, Karnawadi. And the last one that we shall change is this name here, uh, which is Ah Karapat, um, which is one of the fords mentioned uh, on the River Nee. And Ah Karapat is almost certainly at Tuberona and not at the big bridge in the centre of Dundalk. So these are changes that I've made. I have justifications for each of them. I've published them in 2014. And with those then, with these changes, for instance, that last change from there to there, I have revised the route. So the dotted line represents my revisions. The solid line represents uh, what Haley and Kinsella. And you can see that I changed the route on the basis of the folklore references to Amboham Whale and um, to Clohan Meva. And similarly, changing the windy gap to Barnes Bocoolnia, I've changed the route and it follows logically and down and out of loud. That is the map that I've most recently produced. It's unpublished. It's hopefully going to be published fairly soon. Uh, and it's an update on the identifications, getting rid of Haley and Kinsler's attempt and upgrading it as it were. I've taken a couple of innovations with this. I have marked in, uh, as it says there at the bottom, um, hills such as Fahert, such as uh, Fahan Hill, which we saw in the opening slide, which is of course Tippings Wood, and Dramina Hill, which is right behind it beside the Lumpers Pub. Uh, I've marked in and distinguished between base camps and root camps. Queen Maeve quite clearly set up her base camp in Cooley at Finnevar Coolinia. It's quite clearly stated. We'll look at it in more detail as we just before we finish. Um, and I've, um, I'm of the opinion that Finnevar, meaning white water, uh, the white water is referring to sea water, not river water. And there is a place in Cooley called Cooley Point. Um, so surely Finnevar Coolinia, in terms of logic, and geography would be best placed uh, on the coast of Cooley Point rather than at a ring fort uh, near Bush. And we'll explore that a little bit further. So that's the base camp of Queen Maeve's army. I'm assuming, and it's confirmed by the story, that Cuchulain also had a base camp. He was the only warrior available to uh, defend Ulster because the rest of the Ulster warriors were stricken with the pangs of childbirth. Uh, because they had been cursed by Macha, uh, Macha being a goddess who had taken human form and through various uh, misdemeanors by her husband who went to a fair 
at Awan Maka and got drunk and boasted that his wife could run faster than the king's chariot. So the uh, warriors were sent to the house of Maka and she was dragged onto the fair green of Awan Maka and forced to race the king's chariot. She begged for their mercy. They refused to give it. And as she was racing the chariot, she gave birth to twins, hence Awan Maka, the twins of Maka. And she cursed the warriors of Ulster that every time they were in danger, they would, for seven generations, uh, be struck down by the pangs of labor. And I can hear smirks in the background, and quite rightly, 50% of the attendants, uh, or certainly the, 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 the women in attendance, are no doubt having a very well deserved chuckle uh, at that story. It's a wonderfully colorful story. Um, but anyway, that explains why it's only Cucullin who's defending. So these are the two places that the um, opposing forces are based. The sole warrior Cucullin uh, at Dundalgan, Cucullin's castle, castle, and Cooley Point, I'm arguing for Queen May. The second thing to note here is that I also put in what are called root camps, hence here. Now, what are root camps? Root camps are mentioned in the narrative as places where Queen Maeve's army camped. And they emphasize something that has not been foregrounded sufficiently, I think. And that is that Queen Maeve's forces occupied Cooley for probably upwards of two months. It wasn't a cattle raid in a normal sense. Cucullin states twice in the time that he has been defending his homeland from Samhain to Imbolc, which is from Halloween to St. Bridget's Day. Now that's three months, that is winter. And we know it was a winter campaign because Queen Maeve left uh, Samhain, she, she left Rathcrohan um, um, on the Sunday after the Feast of Samhain. So she left uh, on the Sunday after Halloween. Um, and she wasn't back home until the following spring with Don Cooley and Toe. So this is an occupation. So therefore, when we read in the time that there are camps, we shouldn't be surprised. There's a particular sequence in the Toyn, uh, it's about page 99 in Kinsella's translation, if you look it up, where Queen Maeve um, proceeds from Finnevar Coolinia to leave Cooley. She still hasn't got the bull. When she gets to Riverstown, the river rises up against her, forcing her to go upstream. And rather than going through the Windy Gap, she calls the warriors back and forces them to cut a pass through the mountain, which becomes comes Barnes Bocullina. It takes them three days to do that. So she camps one night at Riverstown after they can't cross the river, three nights at Barnes Bocullina to cut the gap. When they get through, they camp in um, Glendalivda, which we don't know where it is, but I suspect it's the valley above Cooley, uh, above Carlingford. Then they progress along the coastal plain, logically, when you think of it. They come to the uh, Ryland River, the Culpa. And they try to cross it, and it too rises against them and drowns a hundred chariot warriors, hence Clune Carpet, the meadow of the uh, wagons or the meadow of the warriors, or of the chariots. They're then forced their way up the river and they cross over Black Mountain, past Claremont Cairn, and come down into uh, Ravensdale. Um, they camp for a night on the mountain itself. Idder Coolinia Augus Colinia, Connella, it states at one point in the narrative. Um, so they're between the two places. When they get down to the river, the River Flurry rises against them also. So the three rivers of Cooley rise in sympathy with the warrior Cucullum. The whole landscape is resisting this invading queen. It's a quite a fascinating motif to think that the landscape resists as much as people resist the invader. They cross the river, um, I suspect, at a place called Culliher Bridge. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the pronunciation. Uh, I see Jerry O'Connor in the audience there. And Jerry, you probably have a, 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 you're a local, so you probably have a good pronunciation. Noel Ross tells me that uh, what is spelled Culliher Bridge is pronounced Curlew Bridge, like Curlew. Anyway, there is a name in the town called Cool Arthur. Arthur being an old kingdom, uh, and I suspect that Cool Arthur and Culerha Bridge are the same place. And there is a ford, almost certainly at that. So they cross the river flurry there, and then they proceed down and they camp at Oaken Hill at Tippins Wood. They must have must cross the river again, and I suspect they cross it at Ballymascanlan Ford, 
Ballymiscanlanford was right behind the houses in the village of Ballymiscanlan, those beautiful row of houses that are unfortunately sadly neglected now. So that wonderful sequence, all in the space of two pages in the time, gives you a sense of the journey of Queen Maeve through Coolia. That is a trail. That's a trail that's grounded on a text that is 900 years old. It's a much more valid tale, uh, trail than the trails that are being presented at the moment. And it would be interesting to see a tourism initiative built around that trail, uh, rather than one that is built on the fantasies of board faulcher personnel, God love them. <laughs> now, to conclude, I want to look at two places um, to give you some sense of um, why I've moved names and what opportunities uh, these particular places uh, offer. One is Barnes Bokulnia, which I've spoken about and which many of you are familiar with. That's the story um, of how Barnes Bokulnia was cut. I'm not going to read it for you because you're probably familiar with it. But it emphasizes the fact that, that they take some three nights and three days to dig up the earth in front of them to make the pass through the mountain. And that is called Barnes Bokulnia, the pass of the cows of Cooley. In Kinsella and Haley's rendering of the Route of the Time, this pass is placed at the Windy Gap. This is a Google Maps screen grab um, of the road from Ahameen up to um, the Windy Gap. That gap, of course, is famous for a number of reasons, but principally for the Long Woman's Grave. Um, this is the sad state that the Long Woman's Grave is in today. Now, I, I, I have a funny feeling it was never in any better state because there's very strong evidence that, firstly, that the road cutting through the Windy Gap was only created um, in its present form in the mid 19th century when they were making the road from Castleton Cooley, from the bush, in other words, right through to Claremont Pass. And there's a strong suspicion that what began, uh, that the Long Woman's Grave began life as a, a pile of um, road makers rubble which somebody then wove uh, an interesting story on top of. Uh, and that's where we end up today. At any rate, I think the Windy Gap should be left to the long woman um, because Queen Maeve wouldn't have anything to do with this um, trifling tale. This is the real Barnes Bokulia, absolutely magnificent roof um, mountaintop gap. It's the product of geology. It fits into a concept in geology called the geomyth. Uh, this is a name I've only come across in the last couple of years, and I recommend anybody who's involved in cultural tourism and cultural heritage in Cooley to look up the word geomyth and apply it uh, to this, because it offers you an opportunity to connect um, Barnes Bokulny or Barnaby of Mountain with geological oddities worldwide absolutely worldwide. Geomyth is a, is a global concept and we have a geomyth in Cooley and we don't celebrate it sufficiently. Wonderful story, as I say, 900 years old, a magnificent mountain top valley, which when you're in it, you can't um, see left or right, as it were. Um, not fully appreciated, um, nor fully uh, its potential. Its, its potential has never been fully realized. One of, one of the most fascinating things about this mountain gap is the fact that you can't see it from the lowlands of Cooley. And that is one of the reasons why the academics, including Haley and Kinsley, missed it. They came to Cooley on a number of occasions, but unless they got out of the car and were guided up onto the mountain, and remember, they were here before the town trail was laid out, so there weren't no trail for them to follow. They were the guys, in a sense, who spawned the trail. The view shed of Barnavave, that's the viewshed of Barnavave. Effectively, it can only be seen in that part of the plain of Cooley. And if you're not there, you can't see it. So if you're not informed that it exists, you're left only with a name on the map. And the name could apply to anywhere in Glenmore. And this is what they thought. They thought the name was misplaced and that the Ashwell Gap was up at the head of the valley. But in fact, this is the viewshed of it. So it's a fascinating idea that this is a mountain top. Um, location, uh, very dramatic, but can only be seen from the lowlands within a very limited uh, point. Emphasize that, I remember one day being in Grange. Um, I probably was on my way into John Long, so it does look closed. 
Um, so it might have been early on the Sunday or something. But I was stunned by the fact that when I looked uh, north, there's the gap, right? Framed beautifully uh, in the cleft in the trees. And it gives you some sense of the hidden nature of this gap that you can only see it from certain points on the peninsula. Those that know it, of course, know where to look, but those who are passing, the passing tourist, would be hard put to find it um, without uh, georeferencing, uh, and certainly there's very little signage to it. For that reason, I picked this screen grab from Google Maps, and I'm suggesting to the community in Cooley, to yourselves, that uh, it might be an ideal location um, to put signage up. If my memory serves me right, directly across the road from the parochial hall is the credit union premises. And there's a car park there. There's a car park in front of the parochial hall. This is an ideal spot for signage. And it's one of the best places in Cooley that you can see Queen Maeve's Gap, which you can see on the horizon as that's left. And as I said, a geomyth, uh, just to summarize it, a geomyth is a geological feature whose origin is explained by a spectacular piece of folklore. And what more spectacular piece of folklore do you want? Um, the only other pla two places in Ireland that match it, to my mind, are the Giant's Causeway in Antrim and the Devil's Bit um, near Templemore in County Tipperary. Now, the Devil's Bit was created by the devil taking a bite out of the mountain and spitting it out. And that spit that he spat became the Rock of Cashel. And that's it, start and finish. Doesn't, doesn't have the same gravitas or depth uh, nor the same vintage as the three days and three nights uh, expended by Queen Maeve's Moriers. So there's a story to be told here, a story to be promoted. The second place that I just want to emphasize the uh, shift that I've made is this place, Finnevar Coolinia. This is some of the narrative concerning the camp that Queen Maeve set up in Cooley. From Finnevar Coolinia, the army scattered and set the country on fire. This is emphasizing the fact that this was an occupation of Cooley, not just a raid. They gathered together all the women, the boys, girls, and cows that were in Coolinia and brought them all to Finnevar. Your expedition was not successful, said Maeve. I do not see the bull. He is now in Dovkara in Glengath, said Lohar. Now, Dovkara is traditionally placed up in Glendurica, where Lissa Chigil is. That's according to Haley and Kensila. But if um, Glengath is the Flurry River, it's much more likely that Guvkora is that hidden valley between Flurry Bridge and Ravensdale Park. It's a deep U-shaped valley. It's the valley through which the motorway and the old road to Newry go. But if you take those two roads out of it, it's a very dark, deep valley, perfectly described as Guvkora, cauldron, black cauldron. Go, said Maeve, and take a withy between a pair of you. Hence, the glen is called Glen Gath. Gath being an Irish uh, pun on the uh, Irish word for withy. Then they brought the bull to Finnebar. So they took Don Coolinia, they found him, brought him to Finnebar. When the bull caught sight of Lothar, he was the herd, the cow herd of Queen Maeve, he disemboweled him with his horns. Then the bull went away out of the camp and they had to pursue him up to Sleeve Gullion where they ultimately caught him, dragged him back to Rathcrohan, where of course he met the white bull of Crochan and they had this epic encounter in which the brown bull of Cooley triumphed and then returned to Ulster, but died of a broken heart. Now, let's look at the shift. Haley and Kinsella have the, um, they place uh, Finnevar Coolinia at the ring fort called Taprath, just beside the bush. We take that out and we replace it uh, by Finnevar Coolinia, as I've explained previously. This is Taprath, it's a fantastic ring fort, a ring fort that should be I daren't say the word CPO because people don't like the word CPO, compulsory purchase order, but this Ringford is right beside a waterworks. I'm not sure if the waterworks are still working. Um, it is the finest preserved Ringford in Cooley. And unfortunately, the quarrymen of Cooley have done severe damage to the Ringfords of the lowlands. And this site should be presented for public um, consumption. Uh, and appreciation. The view from it, these photographs are taken by Kevin Moran um, of the Town March, is absolutely magnificent. Kinsella states in his uh, doctoral thesis that the reason he places Finnevar Coolinia here because it's a nice ring fort and it's the kind of place you'd expect Queen Maeve to set up a fort. 
Now, in 1960s, it was just about possible that uh, ring forts dated back to the time of Christ, which is supposedly the time of the Thine. But that's longer the case. So this ring fort is a place where the story of the Thine may well have been recited in the Mead Hall, but it certainly was not the place where Queen May would have camped. And Finnevar, being white water, uh, strongly argues that this uh, camp that you created is on the coast, hence Cooley Point. This is Cooley Point, taken from Shellon Hill, uh, looking up at Templetown Beach, just there. And this is Cooley Point from the air. Now, Brendan McSherry, the Heritage Office of County Louth, uh, and myself, but principally Brendan, a couple of years ago, did some analysis of Ordnance Survey maps. And Brendan estimated that there has been a loss of land at Cooley Point in the order of 100 metres in the last 200 years. So 100 metres of uh, headland has disappeared. And that would explain why uh, there's no earthwork visible on the site today, because the map of Louth of 1766 and a second one by Taylor and Skinner in 1777 both place a DM, as you can see there, on Cooley Point, DM, Danish Mount. So there was some kind of an enclosure and earthwork on the, on the headland. And this fits the location, possibly a promontory fort, but it fits uh, and adds weight to the placement of uh, Cooley Point uh, as the site of Queen Maeve's camp. And again, that is a thing that would be worth emphasizing. Finally, and I've run over, I, I realize in my time, but I hope you've borne with me. Uh, I'm going to finish on the words of Mary Houghton. Her translation of the time was beloved by Porrick Pierce. He adored it. Today, people look at it and they sigh because if Lady Gregory's Cuchulain and Morhevna seems a little bit dated today compared to Kinsella's translation. Mary Hutton's rendering into high English verse uh, of the story of the Thine is now regarded as rubbish by the scholars and it's difficult to read. But what Mary Hutton does give you is an appendix of place names, uh, the placement of all the names in the Thine at the back. It's a fine appendix. And it's the first time anybody attempts it. So all due credit to Mary Hutton for attempting to place uh, the names of the time. But also she has this wonderfully evocative statement, um, which is full of, uh, I know, sugar and honey, as it were. But in the times in which we live, when we can't visit uh, the old country, in other words, the places about us, it is a source, I hope, of intense pleasure to be able to associate our heroes, not out heroes, and their heroic deeds with certain definite places and to think of them when there. Thank you very much.